grand rising forefront. <laughs> and hello to our virtual community. How are you? I'm sometimes virtual, so those people are awesome. Woo um, and I'm Priscilla Alabi. Um, she, her. I'm a journalist. I'm a storyteller. I make podcasts for a living. Don't ask me to make your podcast. I'm not interested. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a member of the leadership team here, and that's our board for people who don't know. Um, here at Forefront, I'm also a Prishi Boot Camper, like Angela said. This is my second time. And I have to tell you, I'm a little less nervous than I was the last time. Um, and um, last time I was here, I spoke about Palestine and Israel and the war in the Gaza Strip and the need for us as a church to not be silent about what was happening over there, what is happening over there. And out of that came the Forefront Palestine Liberation Task Force and the Forefront Palestine Action Group. And I am so grateful to fellow forefronters who have organized, who have read books on the issue, and who care about justice, and who care deeply about God's heart, and who are really, we're all really striving to, to live up to our values here at Forefront. So let, let's give ourselves a round of applause for that. Um, very excited to be here, like I said. Um, but before I get into that, let us pray, because my mother is here, and she's going to be like, let's pray. So, <laughs> so let's pray. Um, Heavenly Parent, Lord, I thank you so much for another opportunity to be with your people this morning. I pray that the words that I say um, will have a meaningful impact for someone in this room today, maybe someone in the virtual community. I pray that um, people find comfort in these words. Amen. Amen. So let's go back to 1999. Um, January 30th, on an island off the northwest coast of Africa, the Canary Islands, Foy Vance, he's a 20-something musician from Ireland, he was playing at a gig, um, he was playing a gig at a bar called the Jellyfish, and as the night wore on, Foy started to make up songs to see if he could get away with it, and he did get away with it, because people had been partying like it's 1999, and they were drunk. Um, all you had to do was just make noise over and over, play a few chords, and it was fine. So around 1 a.m., as he was improvising, he found a groove, and the words, crying, crying, crying in the night, crying in the night, Jesus is coming like a thief in the night, came to him. Those words, they stuck to him, and eventually when his gig wrapped up that night, he went home with his wife, they were newlyweds at the time, and, but he couldn't sleep. And, um... And that's because the, the lyrics he was singing affected him so much, and he cried through the night. So later in interviews, Foy would say that the song, he, he, was, he was kind of vibing, but like those words were really pregnant with something. That something came in the morning. The news that his father, Hugh Bailey Vance, a former pastor with the Evangelical Church of Christ, passed away at the same time, that very same moment, around 1 a.m., when Foy found his groove with the words, Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. So Bailey Vance, Foy's father, was a towering figure in his son's life. He's described as being extremely jolly and would sometimes do embarrassing things like be affectionate towards his son in public. Um, and Bailey was said to be a deeply spiritual man. And so Foy and his siblings partially grew up in the U.S. in the Black Belt here because their father was a missionary and he was also a church planter. But over the years, Bailey Vance became increasingly at odds with organized religion. I tried to find the specifics, I couldn't find it, but, um, and I don't know what the disagreements are, but um, I do know that many of us in this room, um, Forefront, can relate to the sense of being other from your faith community. So you can you know, fill in the gaps, use your imagination to imagine what the odds may have been. Um, eventually, Bailey Vance walked away from the ministry after two decades of preaching and serving. He later became an alcoholic. Um, and, sorry, I lost my spot. Yeah, he later became an alcoholic um, because he felt guilty about leaving the church and he didn't really know how to deal with the guilt. But he died while Foy was away in the Canary Islands playing at a bar. So as soon as Foy heard the news that his father had passed, he lights a cigarette and um, wrote four verses without stopping. Up until that point, 
songwriting was a major difficulty for Foy. And in the wake of his father's passing, a stream of songs just poured out of him. He says, I couldn't switch the tap off. The faucet had been broken, and the pipe was just gushing. Some 40 songs emerged from those six months to a year of the faucet being broken. One of those 40 songs is called Gabriel and the Vagabond, which is why I'm here today. Um, I was probably 15 or 16 when I heard this song on a little TV show called Grey's Anatomy. Um, at the time, Grey's was this sizzling hit medical drama with doctors named McDreamy and McSteamy. It was very etero. Um, and <laughs> but behind the scenes, they had this awesome music su supervisor. Her name is Alex Patsavis, and she was she made it her business to discover new artists. She somehow got a hold of Foy's demo of Gabriel and the Vagabond, and she put it on the show. And later on, Foy would release an album called Hope with a dozen of those songs um, that he wrote while he was grieving. Um, so when I hear Gabriel and the Vagabond on Grey's Anatomy, all I heard was, um, we are the voices crying out in the wilderness. Um, I'm, I'm not going to sing it because my stomach is in knots. But um, <laughs> when I heard those words, my little evangelical heart <laughs> was like, ooh, <laughs> a Jesus song on a heathen show? <laughs> so I looked it up. And I bought it for 99 cents on the iTunes store. <laughs> um, and so now I'm going to invite Angela um, to sing that song. There's a man in the corner, and his clothes are worn, and he's holding out his hand. You can see in his eyes as the people walk by, he knows they don't understand. You see, they think that he's just going to take their money. And then go out and spend it on dope. Then a man stopped by, and I saw a smile inside him as he gently whispered hope. Well, the tramp started to cry. He just kept saying, why, why, why? Can't you see I'm a down and out? I'm 32, and I've got these one pair of shoes and a bad taste in my mouth. I think it's clear to see that even God don't love me, or else why would he leave me this way? Then Gabriel just smiled and said, be at peace, my child. Salvation is here today. He got up to his feet and he sang hallelujah. People were turning around in the street. He looked him in the eyes and he sang hallelujah. There's someone here you gotta meet, yeah. Someone you just gotta meet. When the vagabond turned around, well, without a sound, Gabriel just smiled and disappeared when he looked at the crowd and they were laughing out loud but he could not see them for the tears 
And when his vision came around, there was a young girl on the ground, and he knew she was finding it hard to cope. She never was a fighter until he laid beside her and gently whispered hope. They got up to their feet and they sang hallelujah. People in the street were turning round. They looked them in the eyes and they sang hallelujah. Oh, there's someone here that we have found, and they sing hallelujah, hallelujah. We are the voices crying in the wilderness, ah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The people in the streets, they started their sins to confess in a chorus of Oh man, I see some tears. In the, oh man, yeah. So, um, whew, okay. That song, when I heard it, um, it was under the seam. Somebody was dying. Someone's always dying in that show. <laughs> um, and it really did minister to me, and it continues to minister to me nearly two d decades later. Um, so, let's, if you. We'll go back at the lyrics a little bit. Um, it's a, there's a narrative. There's a, a, we can infer that the protagonist in the story is a homeless person. And, um, and then there, there might be another protagonist, I'm not sure, but um, um, this person, the people in the story, they're despairing, they're down and out. And the angel Gabriel tells them to settle down, your salvation is here, and they are encouraged. And then um, the person who got the encouragement from the angel Gabriel um, ends up like passing a piece to a young girl who is finding, finding it hard to cope. That's a, that's a really important part um, for me. And basically the, the point is to pass the piece. Gabriel came to our protagonist and then he passes the piece to this person and then the, the person passes the piece to the next person and together they sing hallelujah. Um, so if I take a step back, um, Foy Vance is grieving his father and he, a bunch of songs came out of that. And um, one of these songs is called Gabriel and the Vagabond and it ministers to me. And so maybe the question um, the lingering thing is maybe God was using for his grief to give me hope. Um, and maybe grief is a precursor to having hope. Um, so some of the lyrics from the song are from Isaiah. Some are from various letters by Apostle Paul in the New Testament. But I love that the writer for here just collapses New Testament and Old Testament on each other. Um, so let's look at some scriptures. Um, let's go to Isaiah 40. Um, is that up? Okay. So it says, comfort, comfort for my people, says our God. 
Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for, for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exhausted, exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So what was happening in Isaiah 40? This passage was written during one of the ancient, one of ancient Israel's many exiles, this time in Babylon, from around 597 BC to 538 BC. So it's written while God's people have lost everything. And they've lost their homes, their temple, where they pray and worship has been destroyed. They've been uprooted from their homeland. And perhaps they're being forced to assimilate to a different culture. Things are really bleak for them. They're wondering, does God care about us? Just like the protagonist in, in the song. Does God care about our, our situation? Can God deliver us? Is God willing to, de to deliver us? That is a lot of despair. And maybe you can relate to that. I know I can. I've felt this way at many points in my life. Um, so here's some context for what was happening in my life when I first heard the song. I was a recent immigrant. I had been uprooted from my culture and my people. My mom and I had moved from West Africa to East New York here in Brooklyn. And um, I had a, a thick accent back then. Um, and everything was new. I lived with my mom, my stepdad, my stepsister, and eventually my stepbrother in a two-bedroom in East New York. There was a lot of tension in that house. And let's just say the vibes were, were not vibing. It was not good. Um, I was commuting back and forth to the Upper West Side for high school from East New York every day. That's a three-hour commute um, on the A train and then transferred to BC anyway. Um, and, I didn't <laughs> and I didn't know it at the time, but that's not an easy thing to do at all. And I did that for four years. Um, I was really angsty, obviously, um, and a pensive teenager, and I found comfort in church. I joined the Youth Praise Choir at church, and I was always singing. So as a recent immigrant, hearing the lyrics that there was a young girl who was finding hard to cope in Gabriel and the Vagabond, it was really cathartic for me. The song helped me put my feelings somewhere. Um, I could channel a lot of the sadness and the grief that I was carrying with me through this song, and it made me feel like I was heard and like I was understood. Like, I had a, a sense of camaraderie. And I can articulate that now, two decades later, but I had no clue at the time. I was just like, this is a cool song, yeah. Um, one of the things that strikes me about this passage in Isaiah 40 is that as it is being written in 538 BCE, the people of ancient Israel, they've just been exiled, right? They are in the thick of it. So when Isaiah says, your hardship is over, your service has been completed, Isaiah is not talking to the people who have just been exiled, who are currently experiencing having their lives be uprooted. Um, he's prophesying to the future of Israel, the ones who wouldn't be living in exile anymore. And that's going to take a few decades, maybe even a few centuries before they get to experience not being in exile they're going to have to go to that wilderness for a hot minute, right? There's, there's just no way to fast forward at all. But nevertheless, the prophecy is a message of comfort, letting them know that exile is not a permanent state. The pain, the grief, the despair, it's not for forever. It's temporary. God's promise, God's love, extends far beyond the current despair. So there might be something in this passage for you as well. For Foy Vance, he found hope through his grief. Not at the end of it, not despite it. He had to bathe in that grief water. Um, and he would have never gotten to an album called Hope if he didn't go through that whole process. Um, the truth is that grief is a part of life. And unfortunately, we rarely find joy or hope without first experiencing grief. Most of the time, unfortunately, our pain is a catalyst for joy. And personally, 
I think this sucks. I think, <laughs> I think pain being a catalyst for joy, it's, it's like, what? I don't know. That's, I don't like that. Um, but if you look at the world, um, our world is, it just feels like an extra terrible place at the moment. Um, and, you know, we're more than eight months into this genocide. Palestinians have been displaced, ironically, just like the ancient Israelites. Um, they are in exile in their own land. Despite all of our efforts, people in Gaza are still being indiscriminately bombed. And we're watching. Um, and we're grieving. It's really bleak. Um, there's a lot of despair and there's a lot of grief as we look around our world. And um, we're asking God, like, is this like, really necessary, like, for real? Um, but as I was reading some of the commentary on Isaiah 40, these are some of the, the commentaries that like, resonated with me. The wilderness is often a symbol of desolation and struggle. But in this passage, it becomes a place where preparation and renewal begin. The glimmer of hope can only be seen while in the wilderness, just like we can only see the stars when it's dark outside. The promise that the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it is a vision of a future where God's presence is fully realized among us. This eschatological hope our belief traditionally as Christians that Jesus is coming back. Maybe that isn't something that's going to happen in our futures, in our futures, right? But it probably has a lot to do with our present work, a calling to manifest God's kingdom on earth here and now while things are bleak, while we grieve. Just like the ancient Israelites who were exiled, they just had to keep going. So what feels like a wilderness for us today. What wilderness can we turn into the site where renewal begins? Maybe this passage is challenging us to continue the work of paving the way for justice, even though it might take a few decades, maybe a few hundred years, even if we don't get to see it. So I look back at my time during high school, and it's so clear that I was depressed, but I genuinely, I was, I the self-awareness was not happening, okay? Um, which honestly was kind of a blessing um, because if I had known, I don't, I, I, I don't think I would have, it, yeah, it would not have been very good. But um, I was a part of Youth Praise Choir, like I said, and that kept me steady. It kept me from being consumed by despair. God comforted me through songs like Gabriel and the Vagabond. I can see... God was moving Foy's relationship with his father. God used Foy's grief and Foy's talents to sustain this immigrant girl in East New York. God was cooking. <laughs> That's a Gen Z saying. <laughs> um, yeah, God was cooking. And um, so I'd like to invite you to think of ways that God low-key comforted you and sustained you <laughs> through a difficult season. It's not always obvious, right? Um, so there's a couple of verses in 2 Corinthians that I'd like to look at. Um, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, it says, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us all in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Like Foy's song and the scripture suggest, I have a responsibility to pass on the comfort I have received. We each have a responsibility to pass on the comfort that God has given to us. So maybe you're grieving right now and there is a lot to grieve for. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're struggling with anxiety, or maybe you're just not okay. That doesn't have to be the end of the story. Yes, you're probably going to have to go through it, but God's comfort is available to you as you go through it. I want you to take this message as God passing God's peace to you. Salvation is here today. So... 
Foy's music has only gotten richer, deeper, and more soulful over the years. He recently won an Emmy for writing a song on Ted Lasso. I know people are fans of that show, um, which is another song about hope. He doesn't do Christian music at all, but this dude is clearly, I say clearly having church every single time he's on stage. <laughs> like, check out the song Guiding Light um, on YouTube. I highly encourage you to listen to the performance of it. Um, it has like an orchestra behind him. It's really cool. Um, if you can sing or you like singing, let Pastor Angela know. Um, <laughs> she'll bring you into the fold. Um, join a small group. There's so many small groups that we have now. Um, share songs with your friends. I don't always do that. I don't usually do that. But sharing music can be a very good way of passing the peace or good news to someone. You might just be sending them healing vibes, you know? Um, be a part of a group, like a choir. It's very good for your brain. It's good for your soul. People who do music have bigger brains than the rest of us, so do that. Um, and remember that God can give us hope in unexpected places. We just need to pay attention. You might even find hope in Grey's Anatomy, you know? Um, so be encouraged. It's, 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 we're going to be okay. All right, so I'd like to transition to a time of communion at this moment. Um, the table here is open for everyone. We have alcohol-free juice and gluten-free wafers. Um, there should be a tray in the balcony as well. Um, if you need help getting to the communion elements, please raise your hands and somebody will come and give it to you. Um, right. So we're going to sing some hallelujah songs. Thank <laughs> you. 